Hey, welcome back, dark friends and wheelies. We are here to talk about the second half of my Towers of Midnight review, where we're going to be talking mostly about what happens with Perrin and Matt's character arcs in this story. Uh, the whole Tower of Genji, of course, the whole rescue part that I've been waiting desperately for since I first read that letter in Knife of Dreams. And we are going to be talking about kind of uh, where I stand before I head into the last book. But since there's a lot, uh, I did decide to break this again into two videos because it was going to be well over an hour. So let's go ahead and get into it here. Uh, if you didn't catch part one, I'll put it here for you so you can check that out. Lots of stuff going on. If you're here to hear me rant about Egwene, it was in that video. And you can check that out uh, and, and tell me why I'm so awful or whatever. That's fine. That's fine. But uh, there are some things I'm going to talk about here that I think might be on a little more controversial side for people who love this book because there's some things here I didn't really like and I'm going to talk about why but there are also things here I really really liked so I feel like it is a mixed bag with this book and I think you'll see why in this part so let's kick it off by talking about the wolf brother himself my man Perrin who I have been crying for numerous reviews you can go back I think as far as well crown of swords where I've said, I, I want something to happen with Perrin. Well, look, something finally happened with Perrin, and I'm not really feeling it, and I'm going to talk about why. I don't think I've ever let it be a big secret that the Teleron Riode parts are not my favorite parts of these books. I like it enough, but it isn't like, oh, goody, it's a, it's a TAR moment. You know, I've never really ever felt like that. Uh, so this book taking, you know, 90% of its time in the Wolf Dreams, training with Hopper and fighting Slayer, a character I didn't even care about in The Shadow Rising, a book I love. Uh, yeah, it's obviously not exactly the arc for Perrin that I was hoping for. There are great moments here. Great, great moments that I'll talk about. But there is some stuff I just really think... This feels like a book 6 out of 14 stuff, not a book 13 out of 14 stuff. So uh, let's get into it. Like I said, a lot of it is him training with Hopper. And uh, the other 10% of it is him dick swinging with Galad. So there it is. There's the setup there. But uh, this, it would just to me, it wasn't a plot that was enough to carry an entire book. And I feel just let down in a way that I've been begging for Perrin to finally have a big, big book where he does something besides cry about Fael, and he does that in this one. And to me, it just wasn't crazy interesting. Yeah, I like things. Like, I like the Dream Spike and stuff like that. Uh, but I, I like the hammer. I'll talk about the hammer. But uh, let's go here. Perrin meets Galad, and Bayar insists that he be tried for killing a couple of children of the light. And I started thinking back. I was like, God, when was that? Was was that book one? I mean, I'd, I'd forgot all about this. I had forgot that, that, that Bayer had this grudge against Perrin. I don't even remember the last time it was actually addressed. Was it in Great Hunt the last time I even heard about this? So I had forgotten all about it. So that's why it was like, wow, we're really still doing this, huh? Okay. Again, I'm going with it at this point. But uh, he agrees to be tried and uh, to avoid a battle. Because he, you know, he doesn't want to, you know, cause a bunch of you know, meaningless deaths. And uh, Morgays is the one that's going to be the judge. Now Morgays finds Perrin guilty. <laughs> what? And she says that Galad should be the one to set the punishment. Now I'm just going to say offhand, if this is why Morgays has been kept around this long, was just for this moment. Big letdown. Big letdown, because I have not let it be a secret that I've never really cared for more gay stuff. Uh, I don't quite hate her like I hate her daughter, but uh, it, I was always like, what is her point? What is her point of being here at this point? Because her and Talon were getting married? Who cares? I heard people tell me who cares about uh, Loyal getting married in Knife of Dreams. Yo, that is like the royal wedding compared to this. I Who cares, man? Really? Who cares at all? If you're a big Morgays fan, I mean, hey, more power to you, I guess, if you really got excited about this. But anyway, I was just like, wow, okay, so she found him guilty, and Galad has to be the one to set the punishment. All right, so he goes back into Teleremedio, and he finds this whole dream spike thing that basically prevents you from traveling in or out of a designated era area. It kind of creates, like, this big, like, purple-pinkish dome. When I just kind of thought about, like, the Astrodome. If you guys, you guys aren't from Houston, you probably don't have any idea what the Astrodome is. But Astrodome is the old uh, sports stadium that we had around here that uh, they just want to destroy because of the historical significance. So they're just letting it rot. They don't want to do anything to it. They're just letting it rot. Anyhow, 
Sorry, do you realize That's what I was picturing? It was like a purple version of the Astrodome. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, Slayer ends up killing a lot of the wolves while they while they fight through this whole book. And I, I've said that I never really cared about Slayer. I didn't really wasn't mad about it when it happened in Shadow Rising. It was probably one of the weaker parts of Shadow Rising for me. So I'm not fully invested here. Uh, it, it's it's cool seeing Perrin master everything in here. Even if uh, I do feel like. Much like my problem, when people say I don't ever criticize the uh, the male characters on here, which is bullshit. But uh, I, I do feel like it's kind of rapid how he went from basically Hopper being like, yo, you can't do that yet, to being like the super strongest. But again, I feel like with Matt, Rand, and Perrin, you can use the excuse of Tiviran. That's why they're able to master these things so fast. If Jordan had come out and said, yeah, Egoin is Tiviran too, wouldn't have any of those problems. I'd be going rolling right along with it. I've always felt like that was a get-out-of-jail-free card. Anyhow, yeah, I think it's kind of quick how quick he kind of picks all this up. But uh, he's uh, eventually able to not defeat Slayer, but he, he's able to destroy the Dream Spike and, 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 and get away. Uh, but uh, not before. Uh, he kills a bunch of wolves, including Hopper. So pour one out for Hopper. Uh, I know some folks got upset because I, I told Hopper to stay dead <laughs> in a different video because he, for like three books, he had told Perrin to fuck off. And it was like getting annoying. And I was like, what is your point? If you're just going to tell him every time he needs help, you're just like, nah, I get lost, kid. Okay, it's fine. It, it had a good come around, I guess. I was never super, super attached to Hopper. Doesn't mean I wanted to see him, you know, get tossed off a building or something, you know, or thrown in lava. Or I don't even remember exactly how, where, he, where he fell. Anyhow. I was sad to see him go, but I wasn't like shedding tears or anything. But uh, after that, Perrin and Neol, is that how you say his name? They forge a war hammer in remembrance of Hopper. And it's a power rod hammer. So it's basically, it's like Mjolnir, like Thor's hammer. You know, and it's, it's named something I can't pronounce, but I know that it means he who soars in the old tongue. I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce these names, but very, very cool scene. And it really comes to that point where this is where Perrin finally accepts that he wants to lead. You know, the whole time, I'm not a lord, I'm not a leader, I don't want to be a... Finally, yes, he has become who he was born to be. <laughs> you know, that line again. So, uh, yeah, very, very cool moment. So I, that was probably, that was my easily my favorite parent part in this book was called Forging of the Hammer. And uh, I love me a good Warhammer, and I can't wait to see him mess shit up at Tarmangadian with it. It's going to be so good. It's going to be so good. Uh, but the Trollocs end up, uh, just a huge horde of Trollocs in, in Mjordral end up attacking the White Cloaks, and Perrin's company comes and saves them. So Galad's grateful, and so he decides that the punishment will be that uh, Perrin has to fight with all of his heart or something at the last battle, something really hokey like that, and pay something like 500 crowns or some shit. I don't know. He, and he agrees to, uh, to to help fight at the last battle. And that's that's pretty much it. That pretty much resolves it. Uh, but Bayar, he is not accepting of this. Uh, he's still pissed off, and he tries to kill Perrin from behind. But Bornhold knifes Bayar first. So goodbye, little cockroach. Uh, so it was, it was again, like I said, not really the, the thing I felt like should have carried this book. It, again, it feels like a middle of the series kind of a story, not the penultimate book in the series. I feel like it might just kind of out of place. And this is the first time I kind of feel like, yeah, Gathering Storm and I think Towers of Midnight could have been like one 1,000-page book. That's the first time I start to really feel like that is this story. Because I felt like Gathering Storm was strong enough to stand on its own. But I feel like this one shh, could have really went through it with a scalpel and probably made it a little shorter. Because, uh, yeah, I don't care about a trial for something that happened 12 books ago. So there we are. Let's move on to Matt. This is obviously by far my favorite part of the book. This is what I'm here for. I have been all about this story since we read the letter of Knife of Dreams. And I hate that it took until there was like 60 pages left in this book to get there. Now what I'm going to say is that uh, while I was very satisfied with it, I, I do feel like it was still rushed. Does that make sense? It was very good. I, I don't know. I just didn't like waiting until the last you know, 60 pages. Like I said, I wanted more of this because this was the kind of zaniness that I loved about that segment with Matt in The Shadow Rising and with the Elfin and Elfin. So it, I wanted more of it, and I loved what I got, and sometimes less is more. So 
Uh, I think it's something I just kind of like need to let marinate for a while because I really did like this. I just wanted more, but then I think maybe more might have actually made it less. Does that make sense? Uh, so it starts with Matt. He does get attacked by the golem again. Is it golem or gol? I'm, I hear people say. I started turning into saying golem, and I, it's definitely not golem. So I'm gonna say golem because uh, you know I thought it was like Gola from uh, from uh, from Dune. So so golem, uh, the golem, and it says it's been instructed to kill Tom, Noel, and Tuan to draw Matt out. So he finally uh, decides it's time to take care of the saint. Devises a plan, and he's finally able to defeat the golem by having one of the kin create like a skimming void. Uh, that the the golem will actually fall in and fall like forever. You know, it made me think of uh, of uh, Loki in Thor Ragnarok. <laughs> I've been falling for twenty minutes. You know, that kind of thing. So yeah, it's just gonna fall forever. You know, so that's a a, a nice way because you know it couldn't really actually kill it. So that was about as best way I think as they could have to uh, to kind of end that little story there. Uh, he does meet meet with Elaine, who I will say Elaine is much more tolerable when she doesn't have. 18 POV chapters. So uh, I, I didn't mind her very much in this book at all. I think it's because it was such a small sample size or whatever. Uh, I love that she actually really enjoys the letter that Matt writes to her. And she seems to be uh, a little more, you know, less pompous, I guess you say. So anyway, he finally meets with Elaine and he makes a deal for constructing more of the dragons that Illusia created, you know, because they got the resources and the manpower to, to mass produce these before the last battle or whatever. So they negotiate a little bit and return Elaine finally gets to study the Foxhead Medallion she's wanted since, I think, Fires of Heaven, back when she was like demanding it or whatever. And, and she does actually make a little replicant of it. And uh, that actually played into the whole golem thing, which I kind of glazed over. So that's my fault. But uh, I, it, it was very cool. I thought Elaine had a nice little deal in this book. So um, people who think that I can't be positive about Elaine at all, she's fine in smaller doses, man. It's really, really like that. Uh, and now that the whole battle for the throne thing seems to be over, okay, okay. She's not so bad now. There we go. Uh, but uh, Birgitta, she does tell him about a her previous life's adventure through the Tower of Genji. Now, I like this a lot. This was really cool. And she tells him, she tries to talk him out of going, saying, you know, only one in a thousand get out of that place. You know, and Matt's like, one in a thousand, those are my odds. You know, I he shows her like by throwing coins about how like they're always heads and things like that. You know, he's lucky. So he's going to be able to get out or whatever. But she tells her that, you know, like only one in a thousand get out and that includes me because I died there. And it's, whoa. Yeah, it's a really, really cool story. That's the kind of stuff that I really want to hear more of because I like Brigitta for more reason than just cleaning up Elaine's messes. You know, I, I said that Elaine was a little more tolerable in this, but uh, <laughs> I, I think my favorite moment is when Brigitta's like, yeah, so men told you that, you know, your kids will be all right. That don't mean you just get to act careless and just act like a moron and throw yourself, you know, throw caution to the wind all the time. So yeah, I love her. I want more of her, more Brigitta in, in, in book 14. That would be cool. Really, really cool. Uh, but uh, Matt and Perrin, they have the reunion. Uh, it's fun before they finally hit the tower. You know, they're, they're kind of sharing stories, talking about how they're both married men now and stuff like that. And I started thinking back, I don't remember the last time these two were with each other. I really, really could not recall. I was like, guys, it's all the way back in like Fires of Heaven or something. I don't even remember how long ago since it was these two. I mean, we've had Perrin and, and Rand meet a couple times. And I think we've had... Rand and Matt meet a couple times, but the Perrin and Matt, that combo, I don't think that, uh, I don't, I don't know. Maybe I'm just forgetting it and it was something super small, but it just seems like it's been a lifetime. So uh, this is the point where I feel like I'm having a reunion with some old friends, you know, and still waiting for all three of them to meet back together again. I can't wait for that moment. Uh, so they get to the tower and Tom uses the knife to enter, you know, the, the triangle shape. And I, you did anyone ever think that snakes and foxes that Oliver was always playing was going to be so important? <laughs> uh, you know, I never really thought about it. You know, that the, 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 oh man, which is it? The eel fin or the eel fin? Uh, I think the eel fin are the snakes and eel fin are the foxes, I think. Anyhow, uh, I've got it in here in the notes somewhere. But he uses the knife to enter and inside is a series of doors and hallways and chambers and things like that. And it's real easy to get lost and turned around because things seem like they keep changing. Like there's a couple of times they actually like turn back and walk the way they came and things are different. So it's like, okay, this is a real, real big conundrum they find themselves in. But Matt's dice are all that really keeps them from getting lost. You know, if I roll this, we're going to go that way. If I roll this, we're going to go that way. That's how they seem to be able to get through it. But they encounter a, they encounter a number of the eel fin, that's the foxes, 
and they, they they fight them off, and it's just real creepy stuff. I mean, I don't know if it's supposed to be as creepy as I was imagining it. Maybe I've read too much horror, but I'm just like, this is just like a straight horror show in here. But they eventually make their way to something called the Chamber of Bonds, and they see Moraine there. Matt runs up. He tries to take her. He can't. He's it's like really cold, and Tom's like, I don't give a shit. I'm getting her. So Tom gets her, and he's carrying her, and that's when we're like, yo, if you want her, we got a bargain. Just like, you know, we did last time. So Matt begins to bargain and settles on a price for Moraine, the uh, Angriol bracelet that she has on her arm. And he says, the last part of the deal is, I don't want none of you, none of you foxes trying to stop us from leaving. You know, you know, don't block the path out. And I don't want none of you foxes to stop us from leaving. Real big, important uh, use of words there, as you saw in The Shadow Rising. They're quite literal with these things. And the price is half the light of the world. And I'm just like, I know he's not going to kill Matt. <laughs> I was like, D -d 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 Tamirin, you're not going to kill Matt, right? But they surround him, and I'm actually like scared shitless for him. Uh, Tom and Noel try to fight him off. Matt insists they stand down, or they're all going to die, or whatever. And they just fucking rip his eyeball out i'm just like <laughs> thankfully i had never seen the artwork of matt with a patch I, I saw it after this so i never actually saw matt with the eye patch so that was a shocker to me and, and it made sense but they're just like they're like eating it up but then they like they just kind of like fall over you know like because it's part of the thing they're, they're not allowed to stop him from leaving so they're just like wiped out they're on the floor so they started to, let's get the hell out of here uh the hitch in his wording is that he said that none of the foxes could stop them. And they're obviously, you know, they're honoring this by falling down. But this leaves the Aelfin snake bros wide open to do whatever they want, right? So they try to start fighting their way out. The way's blocked. Noel actually sacrifices himself. And I don't think it was a secret to anybody. Me, Mr. Uh, I'm just along for the ride guy, the one who never tries to figure things out. I knew this was Jane Farstrider. And he says there at the end, you know, tell, tell him that Jane Farstrider died clean. Or whatnot. It was a sacrifice, and while I wasn't like hugely invested in the guy, one thing I've said that I've always had a, a kind of a problem is, is if you cat you create a cast this large, I feel like the body count should be much higher than it is. So seeing a, a, a somewhat pivotal character death, I mean, very tertiary, so I don't want to say pivotal, but uh, it just shows that okay, yeah, there are still stakes in this world, and now I'm just scared. If Tom ends up staying behind here, <laughs> you know, to fight the Balrog of Morgoth or something, I'm going to be very, very upset. Uh, but uh, Matt thinks back to his encounter. They get back and they can't get out. They can't find the way out of the door. Try doing the knife. It's not working or whatever. And Matt thinks back to his encounter in the Shadow Rising. And he asked for three things, okay? One is to have his memories filled. I think we all know, we've all seen that portrayed well over the last you know half dozen books or whatnot two was to escape or be able to uh, you know not be affected by the ice to die we know that we know now that's the fox have medallion but the third was a way out and that's when Rand found him hanging from a tree dead and i always thought okay that was the way out way out of life suicide right death that was a way out uh so one thing that i actually had thought about right after that was like well then what's up with the ocean dairy because he didn't ask for that but it was something I just kind of forgot about o over time. Never really stopped thinking about it. So I never really even considered that. But when Matt thinks about it here, he thinks about, okay, it said I want a way out. And they gave me the Oshendera and I never asked for it. And he actually uses it. And it's what is able to get them out of the tower. So really, really cool uh, payoff to something that I didn't know I was looking for. You know, uh, so I just... That's about the things I see where people say a reread is going to be so, so good because you see these things coming and they make so much sense and they're foreshadowed 10 books early. I mean, that's just, that's spectacular long form writing right there. So again, no problems with anything that happened in the tower. I do wish it had been longer, of course, but uh, that's just because I feel like this is something that I've been waiting for for so long and nothing in these books is rushed. So uh, I didn't feel like it, 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 it's, it sounds like I'm just trying to do one foot in, one foot out. Maybe I am. Uh, I feel like it wasn't rushed, but it was rushed. So I, I don't, I don't know really what I was looking for there, but again, it was worth it. I just hate that it waited until the very end of an 850 page book. You know, that's kind of where I am with it. I was just hoping for this massive 
multi-chapter going up different levels of the Dark Tower kind of thing, I think, here. Maybe that's what I was looking for. But uh, Moraine tells them that, uh, you know, they they, feed, they fed off their emotion. They killed Lanfear because they drained her emotion too quick. And uh, she's very weak with the one power, but she can still channel. And there's that playing that whole bracelet, the angry all thing. And um, she asked Tom to marry her. Like, I don't know where they profess her love for each other. And I kind of got that with the whole uh, dearest Tom thing. I didn't think that was something that you'd write to just a pal. Uh, so the fact that they were actually obviously previously involved. Okay, uh, I'm ready for that spinoff story. And... He, uh, she decides she's going to buy yes, so that means I'm going to be your warder, right? So there, there are a couple there, and Matt's just kind of weirded out by it. He's actually thinking about how he wonders how he's going to be able to fight with only one eye, and he like I think I think he like tosses a dagger and he kills a rabbit or something like that, and then he looks in the pond, he finds like a, a pot, and he's like, okay, so my luck is still intact. That's how I'm going to fight there. So uh, nice enough arc, and, and one thing that I'll say, even with some of my problems with this book. One thing I felt like it has done is it's closed off everybody's kind of loose threads to a point to where we can just focus on the last battle in the last book. And that's what I want. I want the focus on that battle. I don't need to know about somebody's problem with some Aes Sedai I've never heard of and they took an armband or a scarf or something one time. I don't have none of that distraction. We can just focus on the task at hand and that's what I'm looking for. So final thoughts here. I thought I wanted more parent, and it turned out I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe with a character like Perrin, maybe less is more because, you know, the Shadow Rising was where I really just fell in love with the character and I rooted for him and I wanted to, he was the kind of guy I thought I could follow him, but, you know, then giving me, you know, eight books of I don't want to be a leader and nothing in the world matters except for Fael, that kind of diminished it a bit. And then when I get this, I love seeing how much of a badass he is in Teleran Rio. And I think even Egwene even notices that, you know, Channeling is nothing compared to your power in Teleran Rio. And that's it. Obviously, there's no one more powerful than Perrin in there because, you know, I, I talked about where she she tied him up in that. He just kind of shrugs that shit off like it's nothing. You know, and this is supposed to be from the strongest you know, there is right now, right? Uh, so I liked enough of it to just not like admonish this book or something like that. I just, I feel like it could have been done a little bit. Basically, take out the trial part. If you give me just the Teleran Rio stuff, okay. Give me the battle. Why not? I The trial stuff was just over long, and that's kind of where I am with that. Uh, while the Moraine rescue was good, I wish it hadn't waited until the end because, like I said, I was so worried. And I said this, I think, before I even started Gathering Storm, is I didn't want Moraine just to be a character again in the last book. And now it's like she's so depowered. I don't even know how much implication she's going to have in the last book. So I finally got Moraine back. But, uh, you know, she one of the first things she does say is, you know, she asks about Rand and she wants to know where he is. So I'm looking forward to that meeting again to see how Rand handles it. You know, because Perrin and Matt both know now. You know, Matt told Perrin that she was alive. And I don't think Perrin's the, you know, type's going to be like, hey, did you hear? He's not really the gossipy type, right? He, I mean, he doesn't really talk very much to be gossipy. So uh, I, I very much will be interested in seeing... Rand and and Moraine reconnecting and how that goes because you know I felt like they were always they were always in those first four books kind of button heads or whatever and then in Fires of Heaven you know she's basically bends the knee to Rand which we thought was out of character and then we found out why at the end so I'm curious to see how Rand handles that and how she handles seeing Rand at the peak of his power you know and is there gonna be some like a uh, with cat swing <laughs> you know like hey, yo, that's my protege not yours you know so these are the things that i think about um but in the end man i just don't feel like galad and perrin their little back and forth was enough to carry this book if this book was 500 pages maybe but 850 pages this this was definitely not enough to be the meat of the story so that's my bigger problems and i think that there's some a feast for crows in here uh, and what I mean by that is that when you had a story that we were, where it kind of divided the characters up into two, two different branches, and whereas A Feast for Crows was a lot, and I'm talking Song of Ice and Fire if you don't know, uh, A Feast for Crows was the less interesting half of the story told in A Dance with Dragons, you know, in their one story there. So I kind of feel like this is the A Feast for Crows and The Gathering Storm is The Dance with Dragons, whereas it's definitely more lopsided in the favor of of that one but guys there we are 
13 in. I wouldn't quite call it unlucky 13, but if I'm ranking them, this one probably falls in my bottom third. Does that make sense? But there's only been like one book in the series I really just didn't like, and that was Path of Daggers, and it's better than that. It's better than Crossroads. It's better than Winter's Heart. It's better than most of the sluggish stuff. So it, it, that's still there's still some strong stuff in that bottom third. So don't don't be thinking, oh God, you hated this book. Definitely not. I haven't hated any of the books. Uh, there's been some that I think that could have been better, could have been paced better, or whatever. And it's the same with this. Just feel like that there was some pacing issues that could have been handled a little better with a good old scalpel to kind of cut some things down. And, and, and again, I, just like I said with uh, Winter's Heart and Crossroads of Twilight, where I said those were one, you know, 800-page book, it could have just been badass. It could have been fire, right? And I feel the same with this. If the best parts of Gathering Storm and the best parts of Towers of Midnight were combined into one book, it'd be one terrific 1,000-page book, I think. So that's where I am with this. I have had some issues with... Um, I did go ahead and start A Memory of Light. Uh, I already recorded my wish list video, and I'll be uploading that after this review. Uh, like I said, I'm just trying to keep those things in, in order. I don't ever do a wish list video after I've started a book. Uh, I didn't intend to start A Memory of Light until today, Monday, but uh, I couldn't help myself over the weekend. Only about 100 pages in, but uh, already some things in the prologue that have really... Wow. And... Uh, but I won't lie, man. It was kind of one of those things where, and this isn't just like an act. I kind of took that last book out like my hand was like shaking. I was like, this is the last time I'm going to pick up the next Wheel of Time book, you know? So there's a little bit of of excitement, but a whole lot of fear in there. I mean, there's fear of, oh my God, are they going to stick to landing? And oh my God, there's, you know, am I going to be able to process this? And oh my God, this is it. This is it. This has been well over a year of my life now reading this series and growing with these characters. And now that I'm at the end, it's kind of intimidating. It really, really is. So yeah, nervous excitement, but way more nervous than excited, I think. So uh, yeah, that's that's kind of where I'm at, guys. So uh, I want to thank you guys so much for uh, continuing to uh, to watch these and talk with me about them. Um, I hope you don't let my, my, my snootiness about how the comments have kind of derailed lately uh, get you down or how I feel about that one particular character that everyone except me seems to love or whatnot. Uh, but uh, again, I'm always going to be honest. And, you know, I, I think difference of opinion are what makes these conversations fun. You know, I, and I don't think that anything needs to get nasty. I don't think anybody needs to get told that uh, I don't believe that you understand this or you were skimming this. or Guys, I won't even listen to an audio book. So I'm definitely not skimming something. And, uh, and I'm not, not actually reading these things. Ask... Ask my wife how much she gets annoyed when she sees me pulling these out because she knows that my nose is going to be buried in it all the time. So, um, yeah, that's just kind of where I am. So if, if, if that, 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 that annoyed you, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry you feel that way, but I'm going to be honest always. And I want you guys to do the same. I don't think anybody needs to agree with me to continue talking about these things. But, you know, with only one of these left, man, I, I would really like uh, the end of this amazing ride to uh, – you know, finish on a high note with, with the viewers because I've had such a great time with you guys doing these. And I don't see it being replicated. You know, I've got Malazan on the tech, on, on, the, on the docket for next year. And I, I know that, that fan base is huge. I've got Realm of the Elderlings coming up. I know that fan base is huge, but I don't think that they'll ever encounter anything of fandom like I have with Will of Time again. And I don't want to get emotional or anything like that. I might, I might in my last review. Uh, but, uh, yeah, you guys have made it a blast. And I, again, I just want to thank you even though I did get a little sour with the reaction and those Gathering Storm comments or whatnot. But again, this is all kind of new to me because, you know, I haven't had that with uh, with Wheel of Time fans. So it kind of stunned me. That's all. I still love and respect you guys' opinions. And I don't want you guys to, you know, shed your opinions either. You know, just because you think that I might get upset about it. Definitely not. It's definitely nothing like that always am fine with disagreeing and talking about these things. So I'm going to continue to do that. And I just, again, I enough. I can't say thank you guys enough for what you have made this trip. It's been a blast. And even now that I'm at the end, man, it's, uh, it's been educational. So thank you guys so much. I'm repeating myself now and, uh, I'll talk to you with my memory of light wish list, my last Wheel of Time wish list here probably tomorrow. So uh, thanks for watching guys. And I will talk to you in the comments. Thank you.